Was Noah's flood really a world covering global flood? Evidence for a worldwide flood this week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Richard Fangrad. And I'm Kelvin Smith. Our topic this week on the show is Noah's Flood. Right. Uh, how does the Bible describe it? Was it really global? Was it a world covering flood? Um, what does the Bible text say about it? Um, if, if it was global, where's the evidence for it? Right. That's our topic this week. That's right. Many Christians would, would claim today that the flood of Noah's time was, was just a local flood. Right, right? little it flood. It wasn't global. They claim it was confined to somewhere around the Mesopotamian region and uh, never really covered the whole earth. Uh, and, and the discovery of a layer of mud by archaeologists years ago in the Middle East and more recently, um, uh, the finding of evidence for a local flood in the Black Sea have both been yeah. claimed as evidence for a local flood. This is the explanation, not what the plain reading of Scripture right. says. Yeah, people generally gravitate to a local flood because they've accepted the widely believed evolutionary history of the earth, which interprets the, uh, the fossils under our feet as the history of the sequential appearance of life over millions of years, not the evidence for a global flood. Right. So evolution rather than evolution rather than a global flood. Yeah, yeah. science has once un un understood that the fossils, which are buried in water, carried sediments of mud and sand all over the world, to be mostly the result of the great flood. That's originally what they thought. Those who who now accept the evolutionary millions of years of, of gradual accumulation of these fossils have, in their in their way of thinking, explained away the evidence for the flood. The evidence right. is still there, but they're just explaining it in a different, different way and explain it away. Yep. Hence their belief in a local flood, or, or none at all. It was just a, a, a huge myth. And if they uh, would think from a biblical perspective, they would see that the abundant evidence for the flood is, is still there. Yeah. It's yeah, the it's same evidence there. we've been looking at. And now those who accept the eons of time, and of course that's the most popular notion, eons, millions of years, and so on, with its fossil accumulation also, uh, perhaps unwittingly, rob the fall of its serious consequences. They put fossils which testify of disease and suffering and carnivorous activity and animals ripping each other up and death and so on before people appeared, before right. Adam. And that has theological consequences. Before Adam and Eve sinned and brought death and suffering into the world, that's, that's when death and suffering was supposed to enter the world. Uh, with Adam and Eve, as the Bible says. Yep. Now, in doing so, they undermine the meaning of the death and resurrection of Christ. So this issue actually affects this, the core the teachings doctrines. of Christianity. Yep. Yep. Such a scenario also robs God's description of His finished, finished creation as very good. Mm. Yep. Now, we did an episode on that, actually, on that topic last year. If you want to see that, you can go to creation.com slash CML 318, 3-18. And we talked about uh, the very good creation and, uh, and the difficulties with having death and suffering before sin. That's right. You know, sometimes you talk to Christians and, they, and they'll say, well, my, my pastor, he, he, he believes in a, in, a, in a global flood. But you, you almost have to watch terminology sometimes because some yeah. preachers will say that yeah. they believe in a universal or, or a worldwide flood. But really, they don't believe that the flood covered the whole earth. Um, really, what they, they're doing is, in a sense, sidestepping the clear teaching of the Bible. That they and we'll kind of look into that shortly. But they, they give the appearance of believing in it by cleverly redefining words. And this is right. this is something we should examine. They mean universal and worldwide only in terms of an imagined limited extent of human habitation of the time. So wherever humans were. It was a worldwide flood, or it right. was universal yeah. to humans. And they imagine that people lived uh, only, say, in, 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 let's say, a valley in Mesopotamia, and so the flood could kill all the people there without being global in, uh, in scope, so to speak. Yeah, so our topic this week on, on today's show is we're going to examine the evidence for a global, and when we say global, we mean planetary flood. They'll they take the whole earth and you put it in a pail of water, that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and, and we'll get started in 60 seconds. 
Many biologists have long touted that much of our DNA is useless junk. Richard Dawkins put it this way. Can we measure the information capacity of that portion of the genome which is actually used? We can at least estimate it. In the case of the human genome, it is about 2%. Thus, to Dawkins, the other 98% of the genome was useless junk. But these statements are based on ignorance. Just because we aren't aware of a function of much of our DNA doesn't mean that it has no function. A recent paper in the prestigious journal Nature has now shown that about 93% of the human genome is used, not 2 or 3%. And further studies may raise this to 100%. So the whole genome is probably used and there is no such thing as junk DNA. It's an idea that belongs in the trash can, as Bible-believing scientists said when the idea was proposed. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. All right, if you just tuned in, we're talking this week about evidence for a global flood at the time of Noah. Right. Let's look at biblical evidences for a global flood. All right. And the, the local uh, flood idea that we've talked about is, is, is totally inconsistent with the Bible. We're going to show you 12 biblical evidences for a global flood completely covered in water, the entire that's earth. That's what we mean. And we're going to start a, start a list here. And uh, here's reason number one, the need for the ark. I mean, if the flood was local, why did Noah have to even build an ark, right? right? If it was in yes. contained in a certain area, <laughs> uh, of course, he could have just walked to the other side of the mountains and escaped out of the area. Yep. Uh, you know, even just traveling 20 kilometers per day, Noah and his family could have traveled over 3,000 kilometers in six <laughs> months, <laughs> yeah. right? Plenty God, of time to escape some local flood. Yeah, yeah, God could have just told him, hey, Noah, there's going to be a big wet spot here pretty soon. Why don't you just <laughs> jot over there for a little while and, and uh, you know, anyway. Right. Okay. Now, number two in our list here, uh, the size of the ark. If the flood was local, why was the ark big enough to hold all the different kinds of land vertebrate animals in the world? Uh, if only Mesopotamian animals were aboard, or only domesticated animals, uh, the ark could have been much smaller. So yeah. the, the size of the ark is an evidence for a global flood as well. Exactly. Uh, number three, the need for animals to be on the ark. I mean, if, if the right. flood was local, yeah. Why did God send animals into the ark to escape death? Again, just like the people, the exactly, animals could yeah. have gone and spread out. And, and I mean, why would the, the animals be confined to that only one area, if you want to say that, right? Um, there would have been animals in other parts of the, the earth to reproduce these kinds. So, you know, he, he could have just sent them to a non-flooded area or whatever. Yeah, or if they died, other animals would have come in and repopulated. Exactly. No big deal, yeah. right? Number four. The need for birds on the ark. The Bible is very clear that Noah was to bring birds on the ark. If the flood were local, why would birds have been sent aboard? These could have flown away. <laughs> birds, there's a flood somewhere, they fly away. Yep. <laughs> yeah. They can, they can fly several hundred kilometers a day, so it wouldn't yeah, be tough. Yeah, even a large local flood. But the yeah. flood was global, so Noah had to take birds. Yeah. So the judgment was universal. That's what the scripture says. Right. It, it, you know, if the flood were local, then people who did not happen to be living in the vicinity wouldn't have been affected by it, and they would have escaped God's judgment on sin. And it kind of boggles the mind to believe that after uh, all those centuries since the creation, no one had migrated to other parts of the world. <laughs> to believe they just stuck in that one spot, or yeah. that, that people yeah. living on the periphery of such a local flood would not have been, you know, moved to adjoining high ground or, yeah, or something like that. If they see the like water that. coming up, they could take off. Yeah. yeah. Jesus stated that the flood killed everyone not on the ark, Matthew 24, 37 to 39. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Right. When Jesus yep. returns, it will be a global judgment. Yeah. So, of course, those who want to believe in, in a local flood generally say that the world is old and that people were here for many tens of thousands of years before the flood. If this were the case, it's, it's inconceivable that all people could have fit in, in the little valley in Mesopotamia. Exactly. It just doesn't work. Reason six, the flood was a type of the judgment to come. As we just explained in 2 Peter 3, the coming universal judgment by fire is compared to the judgment by water of Noah's flood. It says the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Right, that's verses six and seven there mm -hmm. in 2 Peter 3. Uh, reason number seven, the waters were above the mountains, okay? 
uh, it describes this here. If, if the flood was local, how could the waters rise 15 cubits, that's about 7 meters or 20, uh, 22 and a half feet, above the mountains? It says that in Genesis 7.20. Water seeks its own level. How could you cover all the mountains and not have it be a global flood? That's right. It just doesn't make sense. I, I once talked to a guy and he said it was perspective. If you were down here and you looked up, I said, it still doesn't make sense. There's got to be a mountain up above where the water, it, it, it's, it's silliness. Okay. Uh, reason eight, the duration of the flood. No and company were on the ark for one year and 10 days. Genesis 7, 11, 8, 13, and 14 says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were opened. Uh, then when the flood began, it ended uh, in the 601st year, in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. So we, we've got a time period there. Right. Um, yeah, it's a little over a year. That's right. Uh, that's an excessive amount of time for any local flood. <laughs> uh, that's a huge amount of time. Uh, it was more than seven months before the tops of the mountains were, became visible. How, right. how could they drift around in a local flood, local flood, without seeing the tops of mountains? Exactly. That's amazing. So, uh, so we'll continue there, with our list here. When we get back, sure. we'll see you yep. in a bit. Let's take a break. Refuting evolution is a powerful, concise summary that explains where the common evidences used to promote evolution in textbooks are wrong, while at the same time showing how creation is better supported by scientific observations. It will stimulate much discussion and help students and teachers think more critically about the creation-evolution debate particularly the often overlooked differences between operational and historical science and how they relate to the topic of origins. Order your copy today at creation.com. All right, Noah's flood was indeed global. We're going through a list of, uh, of, of, of reasons why it had to be global from, from Scripture here, so we'll yep. continue with that list. Number nine on our list here, God's promise broken? Mm. What's happening there? If the flood was local, God would have repeatedly broken his promise right. not, to flood the, not to destroy the earth in that way again because, of course, there have been thousands of local floods since the time of the Great Flood. If, right. if Noah's flood had also been local, uh, God would have been breaking his promise. For example, there have been huge local floods in recent times in Bangladesh, for example, where 80% of that country was inundated. Right. Or in Europe in 2002, there's a massive flooding there. If Noah's flood was only local, what would God's promise mean never to send a flood again? doesn't right. make any sense. Yeah. Uh, reason number 10, all people are descendants of Noah and his family. The genealogies of Adam, Genesis 4, 17 to 26, 5, 1 to 31, and Noah, uh, Genesis 10, 1 to 32, are exclusive. They tell us that all the pre-flood people came from Adam yep. and that all yep. of the post-flood people came from Noah. Noah yeah. The descendants of Noah were all living together at Babel and refusing to fill the earth, right? That's as they'd been commanded. So God confused their one language into many and scattered them. That's what the scripture clearly teaches. Yeah. We yep. did an episode. Uh, last year, yes. titled The History of the Nations, <laughs> where we uh, presented evidence for, for uh, many na nations originating from Noah's 16 grandsons. And you can look that up, creation.com slash CML312. Season 3, episode 12, The History of the Nations, uh, explains that. Yeah, it's a fun little episode. Yep. All right, another evidence uh, that all people have come from Noah uh, is found in flood stories from many cultures. You have, right. you have uh, cultures around the world, in North and South America, the South Sea Islands, Australia, Papua New Guinea, uh, Japan, China, India, the Middle East, Europe, Africa. Hundreds of such stories have been gathered over the years. The stories closest to the area of dispersion from Babel are the nearest in detail to the biblical account. For example, the Gilgamesh epic. You look at the Gilgamesh epic there, that's, that's, uh, it, it's pretty close, but you can tell which one's the real one. Right. The ark in the Gilgamesh epic <laughs> is a nine-story cube. <laughs> Try floating in that. <laughs> Try floating around in that. It might yeah. as well be a nine-story sphere, yep. and, uh, just a seaworthy. Um, reason number 11, the Hebrew terminology at Genesis 6 to 9. I mean, this is the way we're to understand Scripture. What does it actually say, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the earth, the Hebrew word eretz, is used 46 times in the flood account in Genesis 6 to 9, as well as in Genesis 1. The explicit link to the big picture of creation, especially in Genesis 6, 6 to 7, clearly implies a universal flood. Furthermore, the judgment of God is, is pronounced on, on 
not just on all flesh, but on all the earth. On the earth, yeah. Right. Yeah. So it just wasn't a group of, of people or animals in one area. And uh, God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, uh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Yeah, we have the phrase also in Scripture, upon the face of the earth. This phrase appears in Genesis 7, 3 and 8, 9. It clearly connects to, with the same phrase in the creation account where Adam and Eve are given the plants on earth to eat. That's in Genesis 1, 29. In God's decree, the mandate is universal. The whole earth is their domain. And so we, we have that phrase used again with the flood. God uses the phrase again in Genesis also of the dispersal of people at the Tower of Babel. You can see that in Genesis 11, 8, and 9. Again, right. the context is the whole land surface of the globe. Um, the exact phrase is found nowhere else in Genesis. Yep. And the phrase face of the ground, that's used the five ground. times okay. in the flood account. It also connects back to the universal context of creation in Genesis 2 to 6, where it says, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Again, the, everything, yeah, right? Yes. Yeah. Again, emphasizing the universality of the flood. Ah, there's another phrase here, all flesh. Um, uh, it's used 12 times in the flood account and nowhere else, nowhere else in Genesis. Uh, God said that he would destroy all flesh apart from those in the ark. For example, here in Genesis 6, 13 and 17, in the context of the flood, all flesh clearly includes all nostril breathing, like air breathing, land animals, as well as man. Uh, for example, you can see Genesis 7, 21 to 23, and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. And it goes on from there. All flesh could not have been confined just to the Mesopotamian area. It doesn't That's make right. any sense. And, and the phrase, every living thing, uh, the Hebrew kol chai, uh, is again used in the flood account in Genesis 6, 19, 8, 17. And it says this, And of every living thing, of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. It's also used in the creation account in, in uh, Genesis 1.28. In the, the creation account, the phrase is used in the context of Adam and Eve's dominion over the animals. God right. said in Genesis 7.4 that he would destroy every living thing uh, he had made, and, and this happened. Only Noah and those with him on the ark survived. Yeah, again, more evidence for a global flood, and we'll be back with even more after the break. How did the peacock get such a spectacular tail? Bothered by this question, Charles Darwin wrote, The sight of a feather in a peacock's tail whenever I gaze at it makes me sick. Sometime later, though, Darwin proposed his theory of sexual selection, which basically says that the peacock evolved its exotic tail to attract a mate, thus helping it produce more offspring and thus increasing the numbers with attractive tails. But a recent critical review published in the prestigious journal Science has pointed out that the theory has fatal problems and needs to be replaced. However, other evolutionary scientists have rushed to Darwin's defence, contending that the authors failed to provide a genuine alternative theory. But what if there is no evolutionary explanation? Perhaps the peacock tail continually evades an evolutionary explanation because it didn't evolve, but was designed after all. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. All right, we're going to continue our list of the biblical terminology that's used to describe a global flood, not a local flood. So we're we still can, on point 11 here. We're still on point 11, yep. the biblical terminology for a global flood. The phrase under the whole heaven is also used in connection with the flood. For example, right. in Genesis 7, 19, and the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven, there it is there, were covered. It's used six times outside of the flood account in the Old Testament and always with a universal meaning. And you can see the other places where it's used there on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in Job 41.11, whatever is under the whole heaven is mine, says the Lord. This terminology is, is again, understood to be universal, not local. Right. Um, also, all the fountains of the great deep. There's another term. The fountains of the great deep are mentioned in the flood account in Genesis 7.11 at the beginning of the flood where it says, 
On that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heaven were opened. And then in, in Genesis 2, at the end of the flood, it says, the fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained. This is also mentioned in, in Proverbs 8, 28. Right. right? The deep, the Hebrew, uh, Tihom, relates back to creation, Genesis 1 to 2, where it refers to the one ocean covering the whole world before the land was formed. And this again speaks of something that is global, not local. Right. Yeah, so from the text, we can see very clearly that the flood covered the whole earth, every bit of land on the planet. It was global. It yep. was truly a global flood. So we've covered 11 reasons so far why the flood was global. There's, there's one left. Yeah. Reason number 12. And that's the New Testament speaks of the flood as global as well. Yeah. Yeah. Not <laughs> New, just Genesis. Exactly. New Testament passages which speak of the flood are universal language. Jesus, in, in Matthew 24, 39, speaking, said this, the flood came and took them all away. Luke 17, 27, Jesus says, The flood came and destroyed them all. 2 Peter 2, 5, Did not spare the ancient world, and that Greek word is cosmos, right? Which means the, the, the entire world. But preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. 1 Peter 3, 20 says, A few, that is eight people, were saved through the water. 2 Peter 3, 3, 6 says um, the world that was then being flooded by water perished. Uh, all these statements presuppose a global flood. You can't mean, make it mean some localized flood with, without doing great harm to the plain reading of Scripture. Right, right. So there, there are some basic reasons uh, from Scripture that the, the text clearly indicates it was a global flood. Now, there's some, uh, there are some objections to that. And we can, we can discuss some objections in the time we have left here. Yep. Objection, uh, uh, objection number one, all, all the high mountains, that kind of thing, does not always mean all. And that's true. That's true. Some have argued that since all doesn't always mean every, every you know, each and every instance of uh, that kind of thing, it, the word all in the flood account doesn't necessarily mean the entire surface of the earth. Right. For example, in Luke 2, 1, it says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Well, in the context, it clearly refers to the Roman Empire. Right, the Roman world. Um, yeah, not all people on the planet. So there's, there's an example. People point to that. Yeah. Right. Of course, in context, though, it means the Roman world. It means but the Roman <laughs> world, right. It doesn't mean, yeah. it doesn't Cause, mean everybody. Because the meaning of a word is decided by the context. So yes. In Genesis 7, 19, <laughs> when we read that all, uh, you know, all, the Hebrew coal, the high mountains under all the entire heavens were covered, you, you got to note this double use of all. In Hebrew, it's emphasized. This, yeah, this right. gives great emphasis. This, it, it eliminates any possibility of ambiguity, right? Right. So this could be accurately translated as all the high mountains under the entire or whole heavens um, were covered yeah. to a depth of more than 20 feet. Now, this is, this is a, a popular question. It's actually one of the chapters, just a single chapter in our Creation Answers book. Mm, yes. The Creation Answers book is our most popular book because it answers more than 60 of the most asked questions. You can get it at 30% off, both the ebook and the print version. And when you sign, go to, go to creation.com and purchase the book. When you sign out, use the coupon code CMLCAB, Creation Magazine Live, Creation Answers book. It's a fascinating book. You'll want to get, it, you'll, you'll want to get yourself a copy. Everyone likes to get things for free. Thanks to donors at Creation Ministries International, we have put great effort into making huge amounts of faith-building information freely available online. Creation.com now has more than 8,000 articles. Some of CMI's most popular books are in PDF format to read online for free. All 48 episodes of Creation Magazine Live and other teaching videos are online at no charge. Consider making a donation, enabling us to continue producing free faith-building information. Well, if you just tuned in, we're talking about uh, this week about whether the flood of, of Noah was was global or local. Right. We've just given you a lot of ammo, reasons why it was <laughs> global from straight from Scripture. And now, of course, we're dealing with co some common objections to uh, to our stance. Right. Yeah. Here's objection number two: the post-flood geography is the same as the pre-flood geography. Well. That's because people see the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Uh, they were mentioned in the description before the flood with the Garden of Eden, associated with the Garden of Eden, and we have the Tigris and Euphrates now. Right. So people say, well, a global flood obviously would have altered the topography, but it didn't because we have the same rivers. That's right. But um, 
Of course, that, that doesn't that doesn't work well, either. There's some major differences <laughs> in the topography described in the Garden of Eden in the world now. Yes, there was one river flowing from Eden, which separated into four rivers. Uh, you can read that in Genesis 2, 10 to 14, two of which were called the Tigris and the Euphrates. So the rivers had a common source before the flood, which is very different from today. Uh, so yeah. the other two rivers yeah. don't appear post-flood. Yeah, so it's, it, it actually is different topography. Yeah. Um, so, so why would... Uh, we, we have those today. Those rivers today, actually, another reason is they're flowing on top of not just feet, but miles of flood-deposited <laughs> sedimentary rocks. Those are not the pre-flood rivers. Yeah. So the, the question is, why do they have the same names? Well, I'll give you a really well, quick, easy answer. Yeah. I, I live in Guelph, Ontario, Canada, and I live on Glasgow Street, and Nottingham is a street right next to me, <laughs> and Essex is another street right next to me. And when I visited uh, the UK earlier this year, guess what I found? Yeah. We borrowed all our names in, from Guelph. Yes. From <laughs> the settlers of the New World brought the names from the Old World with them. We can imagine the same thing happened before and after the flood. Noah or his sons or their wives or whatever brought those names with them. And, uh, and we and can understand it. Recycled them. Yeah, recycled them. Yep. <laughs> Objection three. There is no evidence for such a flood in the geological record. Well, you'd have to be a little blind, I, I think, to, to believe that. Well. <laughs> You've got to buy into the fact that these sedimentary layers all got laid down slowly over millions of years, but there's massive evidence they got laid down quickly. Um, what evidence would you expect uh, from a global watery cataclysm described the way it is in, in Genesis 6 to 9? that drowned the animals, the birds, the people not on the ark. All around the world, uh, in, in rock layer after rock layer, we find billions of fossils, right? Right, yeah. Dead things that are buried yeah. in water, uh, carried by mud and sand, and the, there's, their state of present, uh, preservation indicates that they were buried incredibly rapidly. So even yeah. dinosaurs six feet tall when they're slumped over have been covered in so much sediment so quickly that it preserves things like soft tissue yeah, in these yeah, dinosaurs. They're beautifully preserved. I mean, the, 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 there's a beautiful cause and effect relationship between the fossil record and the, and the flood. Right. What's the effect? A worldwide fossil record showing evidence of rapidly buried plants and animals all over the world. And yeah. the cause of that is a worldwide flood rapidly burying plants and animals. That's beautiful. Right. <laughs> it just works out really, really well. Exactly. Um, the uh, severe deformation of thick layers of sediment without evidence of cracking or melting also shows how all the layers must have been still soft when they were bent, like here in Grand Canyon. Look at this, this diagram. Now, there are processes that can, in a sense, bend rock. You don't normally bend a piece of rock. Right. But if you were to heat rock you know, with a lot of uh, excessive temperature and stuff like that, there are ways that rocks can, can actually shift. But then you'd see elongated sand grains and, and, and cracked crystals and stuff like that. We don't find that in these massive yeah. sedimentary yeah. uh, layers. If you have doubts about the accuracy of the Bible or more questions about our topic today on this show, this is our last show of Season 4 of Creation Magazine Live. Yeah. Creation Magazine is a fantastic resource for you to answer questions, to, to strip away those doubts you have about Scripture. You can view a free copy online. Go to creation.com slash freemag, and we'll see you next year.